Welcome to chapter 4 of the Jack Code JF010E transmission. In this chapter you'll learn th theory and operation of this unit. We'll also include computer strategy, component pinouts, solenoid strategy, clutch supply charts, related input and output devices, and hydraulic diagrams. My name is Jared Warren and I'll be your host for this course. It's a great day to fix transmission, so let's get started. The JF010E has the following components. Uh, a torque converter like a normal transmission with a lockup clutch increase for uh, fuel economy and engine torque. Torque converter is over here and you have a single lockup clutch. It has a tritoil uh, oil pump. Oil pump's right here. Uh, the oil pump basically is a gear style oil pump. Um, the gears um, the inside teeth part are rounded uh, instead of pointed like some some of the gear styles. So this is a rounded inner gear style pump. Has a uh, single planetary setup right here in the middle. Has a forward clutch um, right here in, in the middle of the transmission also. Has a reverse brake out here on the outside of the the case toward the center of the trans. We have a primary uh, pulley setup, the belt, secondary uh, pulley setup. Secondary pulley has an output gear on it here, it powers the transfer gear, which powers the, the pinion gear, which powers the differential. The valve body and the solenoids uh, control the flow of oil and the operation, and the TCM uh, control module for the uh, control of the input and outputs of the main system. So here we have basically a, a diagram of uh, what's all involved in this whole system. Here we have the TCM. Um, the TCM receives input from your secondary speed sensors, transmission range switch, primary speed sensors, um, the ROM and electro, uh, electronic control valve body. Also receive signals through CAM bus on the ECM the combination meter, ABS module, all-wheel drive control unit if it's all-wheel drive, and a, a body control module. Also the uh, TCM um, puts out um, voltage and controls the uh, control valve body. Um, the control valve body of course controls the forward and reverse engagement uh, the torque converter, the belt assembly, the final uh, belt assembly is uh, connected to the final drive assembly, to the differentials and out to the wheel. This is just an overall um, syst uh, diagram of the whole system itself. One thing I'd like to bring up, do not overlook any other codes or issues before working on this transmission. What I mean by that is like your ABS code, wheel speed sensor codes, um, those kind of things, engine speed signals, uh, mass airflow sensor, throttle body codes, charging system. So this whole transmission is integrated into the whole car. So we got to look at the whole system, the whole car, before we start diag diagnosing this transmission. Some of the main sensors and components. In, inside the car we have your accelerator pedal position sensor. It's on the accelerator pedal itself. We have a overdrive control switch or sport mode switch in some cars. Up on the dash it gives you the shift position indicator and the overdrive uh, indicator switch or, or light. TCM, um, most vehicles, is under the hood. Um, on the next to the main uh, electrical system uh, on the uh, passenger side uh, you'll see where the TCM is the transmission itself not too many sensors on the outside of this unit we just have the secondary speed sensor or vehicle speed sensor up here on the top of the transmission the range switch primary speed sensor stepper motor secondary pressure solenoid valve uh, line pressure solenoid 
torque motor clutch solenoid, shift control uh, solenoid, the secondary uh, valve, manual valve torque converter, lockup select solenoid valve, temperature sensor, secondary oil pressure sensor, and the ROM assembly is all inside this transmission, and uh, main connectors are at the uh, CVT connector itself, the main harness. A lot of problems with that connector and harness right there, so uh, pay close attention to that connector. We're going to start going over some of the sensors that uh, control this transmission or give inputs to the TCM that controls the operation of the transmission. One is the mass airflow sensor. It's basically in the uh, intake air uh, tube. It measures the flow of air into the engine. Uh, this, this is a major uh, engine load device. It tells the transmission how much throttle, how much, how hard the engine's working, and it controls uh, shift points or ratio change timing and also uh, pressure to the transmission. So normal readings, uh, mass airflow sensor and idle uh, with the engine or with the key on engine off you're looking at basically 0.4 volts um, when the engine is running you're looking around 0.9 to 1.2 volts some scan tools put it uh, grams to milliseconds so 0.2 to 0.6 grams to milliseconds when you're cruising 2500 rpms now uh, you're looking at about 1.6 to 1.9 volts itself. So here we have um, from like a dead stop, slight uh, acceleration. Um, we're starting out here just under one volt or around one volt and accelerating up and the voltage will increase. Uh, of course, it'll increase more throttle you give it or more um, engine load going up a hill this voltage should increase because there's more air going through the engine so this top graph is, is what a, a good look looking sensor uh, on the scan tool is going to look like so if you you see a flat line or you see very little change like on this bottom graph here you have a, a dirty mass airflow sensor or or possibly uh, need to replace the mass airflow sensor The throttle position sensor, um, so we have a TPS for the throttle position sensors on the throttle body. There's basically two sensors in the TPS system, uh, TPS1 sensor and TPS2 sensor, and they work opposite each other. So this basically is telling the computer the position of the throttle uh, blade or the throttle body, how far open or closed it is. Like on temp, uh, uh, throttle pressure sensor one, let's see here, sensor one, it's going to start out at, at low voltage. As the throttle is opened, sensor one voltage is going to go up. Sensor two voltage works just the opposite. It's going to be roughly um, 4.75 volts uh, closed. And then when you give it full throttle, the, the voltage is going, to, is going to go down and you're going to be about 0.36 volts. So sensor one voltage goes up, sensor two voltage goes down. The throttle position or the throttle body is controlled by your throttle, uh, your accelerator pedal sensor. It's basically installed on the throttle pedal itself. The aft pedal has a five volt power, a ground, and then it also has two signals, so signal one and signal two. Signal one, when it's released, is low voltage, 0.5 to 1 volt. When you fully depress the accelerator pedal, it's going to go up to about 4.2 to 4.8 volts. So signal one, low voltage to high. Signal two, two is just the opposite. When it's released, um, it's 0.25 to 0.50 and then the voltage does go up, so I should not say it, it's opposite like the uh, throttle position sensor, but it does go the same direction. It increases 
uh, voltage along with signal one. So both, both signal one and both signal two are increasing voltage. Signal two increases voltage at a, at a lower voltage. So fully depressed it's uh, 2.0 to 2.5. Engine coolant temp temperature sensor. Uh, this is a important sensor. Let's say if the engine coolant temp is too low you may not have any lockup shift points or ratio changes may be affected so you also always need to check your engine coolant temperature sensor so we got a graph here if we're at 14 degrees Fahrenheit the voltage is going to be 4.4 uh, volts and ohms is going to be 7,000 to 11.4 thousand as engine coolant temperature rises see we get up to 194 degrees Fahrenheit the voltage is, is going to decrease on the sensor about 0.9 volts and the resistance is, is going to decrease so 0.236 to 0 0.260 is 194 um, degrees Fahrenheit the ECM and TCM both use the sensor uh, for shift strategy. Engine oil temp. Um, it's an important sensor. It's not. It's used for engine load um, for the whole picture. It's not directly related to the transmission, but it can cause some issues, so we do need to make sure the engine oil temperature sensor is not reading out of range. So the resistance is, is high uh, when it's cold, and it will go down in resistance uh, as it warms up. So very f similar to the uh, coolant temperature sensor at 14 degrees, we're at 4.4 volts 7 to 11.4 thousand ohms at 230 degrees uh, voltage drops to 0 0.6 and your resistance is 143 to 153 ohms the air air intake uh, temperature sensor is built into your mass airflow sensor The resistance is high when it's cold and the graph goes down when it warms up so at 77 degrees you're looking at about 3.3 volts the resistance is 1.8 to 2.2 thousand uh, ohms around 176 degrees or so the voltage is going to be 1.2 volts and your your own is going to be 283 to 359 uh, ohms So we're going to go over some pinouts. There's basically is two designs of uh, TCMs. So I'm, on this, I'm going to have a design one uh, on a lot of these pages and design two. We have only found two different TCM configurations and wiring for the most part. But we need to make sure that you confirm with your your making model. Make sure you pull up a wiring diagram. Don't use all these graphs as 100% correct because there may be some different models uh, that may change some pin locations around. But this is what we have found for the majority of these two different types TCMs. Looking into your transmission case connector, this is actually you pull the case connector off the transmission and you're looking into the connector going to the transmission itself. This can be quite confusing as you see they have no pattern, um, they don't count, count the pins straight across or anything like that. So what I mean by this, you don't see one, two, three, four, five on the bottom row or anything. As you see, the numbers are all mixed up and they don't really have any pattern to the pin layout, which makes it confusing. This is design one. It has two TCM connectors. And there's more of a pattern to these. You see how the pattern, the numbers are straight across 1 through 9 on the top row, 10 through 18. 
and 19 through 24 on the bottom. So at least they gave us some kind of pattern to make it easier to find for the TCM connectors. Over here on the chart, trans pin, trans pin number. This is the trans connector right here that we're talking about. TCM pin number. This is the pin number on the uh, TCM, these two connectors here. And then the component that, that we're measuring or that we're testing. So as you see here, like stepper motor A is going to be tra uh, trans pin number 6. So we look at number 6 right here. And it's going to, the other end of it, number 11, is going to kick connect down here to the TCM. So we gave you both pin locations on this graph um, for the design one. This is the design two. The TCM um, is a single connector. As you see, the numbers here have some type of a pattern, but off to the right hand side, they do differ uh, are different. So it's not. It does get confusing. Just pay attention to the the diagram on which pins you're looking at. Um, I don't know why they did not make these pins a little bit more organized and easier for us to diag, but that's one thing that Jacko doesn't do, make things easy for us. So, TCM connector is the F3 connector is what that called. The trans case connector is F24. So just like on the, the, the page before, we have trans pin number on the left, the TCM pin number, and then the circuit we're testing. So on design two, stepper motor A circuit is still pin number six on the trans, and it's the TCM connector would be pin 30. Some of these um, pins and connectors, there's not much testing that we can do on them, mostly to do with the, the data select three, uh, clock select two. Um, these are the ROM um, wires they don't give much diag purpose for us unless we we have a bad uh, wire or something like that or we want to test the ROM wiring then we would go to uh, like 16 and 10 to to check and make sure the data select wire is three but if you're measuring voltage uh, no uh, you, not a great way of testing the, the ROM itself we'll get into that a little bit later Here's a basic wiring diagram for design one. Um, so design one has the two case connectors uh, on the TCM like we're talking about. For the most part, we have determined that the, the RE0 F09A usually has the two case connector or, or two TCM connectors, and the B model has one case connect uh, one connector at the TCM. It's not a hundred percent accurate but it's about 90 percent accurate. Um, there are some A models that have uh, one pin con connector at the TCM in the design two style. So again make sure you look up your wiring, make sure you look up your pin, pin charts um, for the model you're working on. Thing that I like to bring up also on the wiring, you see these solenoids here. These solenoids are all grounded to the valve body itself, and the TCM is is sending power to control the solenoids. You also see a couple of ground wires um, are shared for the stepper motor. They're connected to the valve body also, and you see a lot of the um, same sensor voltage and sensor grounds on the secondary sensor primary speed sensor and the primary pressure sensor and the temperature sensor are using some of these same wires this is the design too um, same thing the grounds for the TCM or the excuse me the solenoids um, TCM is sending power same grounds are used on stepper motor, shared to the range switch, same along with the same speed sensors and pressure uh, switches. They're also using some uh, shared grounds and some shared powers here. This is the design two wiring. 
as I'm going through uh, theory operations in some of these pinouts, I'm going to talk about uh, design one, design two, so it's going to get kind of a little confusing. I tried to break this up to, to make it simple as possible. A lot of my charts here, you got your sensor pins. These sensor pins are at the sensor itself. So pin one is five volts. Pin two is signal. Pin three is ground. So I've labeled these sensors and broke out each connector uh, to make it easier for us to test. Most of the time, you're not going to be testing uh, the pressure switch and stuff voltage inside the trans right here. You're not going to be back probing that. But if you need to, you can. Uh, these pin connector views are mostly for the bench. So if you wanted to put 5 volts to pin 1, ground on pin 3, vary your pressure and check your signal to see if your switch is working correctly before you install the transmissions. It is a good idea to do if you're having sensor uh, issues. Trans connector pins is just that. The case connector, design one, design two are the same. Uh, design one TCM pins are here. Design two TCM pins are here. So pressure sensor B is located right next to the uh, connector on the inside of the transmission here. Pressure sensor B is uh, the primary pressure sensor. It measures the primary oil pressure to the sensor, it's a Hall effect uh, sensor. Has five volts going to pin one, ground on pin three, and the signal wire changes voltage as pressure changes. So at an idle in uh, at an idle in neutral, you're going to be looking at about 0.7 to 1.2 volts uh, on the sensor. And if you turn the key off, or the engine off, key on you're going to have about 0.2 volts on this uh, pressure sensor B. And max, max pressure voltage is 4.5 volts is max pressure and max voltage. So if you are getting a pressure sensor uh, circuit code, you'll want to turn the key off, or then turn the key back on, engine off, see what your voltage is there. You should have about 0.2 volts. Start it up, see if your voltage goes up to about 0.7 to 1.2 volts. That's going to tell us if the switch is actually working or not. But it will set a code if voltage is outside of these conditions. So pressure sensor A is the secondary pressure sensor. It measures uh, secondary oil pressure. Same type of sensor, same sensor as pressure sensor B. Has a 5 volt power, pin 1, ground, pin 3, and the voltage changes. Normal voltage is about 0.8 volts in neutral at an idle. Same testing with the engine off here, about 0.2. Max, max amount of voltage that you'll ever see is uh, 4.5 volts. And again, here's the uh, inside on the sensor itself, pins. Trans connector pins, design one and two pins. So this is using Shop uh, Scream Connect. I saved a movie and uh, brought it over to PowerPoint here. This is what your scan tool is going to look like. I'm graphing out um, your primary uh, pressure sensor and your secondary uh, pressure sensor. So right here, we're at a dead stop, and then we're starting to accelerate. As you see, the graphs are not going to be exactly the same between the primary and secondary because oil pressure and gear ratios are changing. But as you see, this is a, a normal uh, pressure reading. So at a stop, your uh, primary pressure sensor voltage was 0.86 volts. You take off. And the engine load and pressure increases, and then it starts to slow down when you, when you are cruising. So, what what the main point here is is when the engine load is higher, when we're starting to take take off and accelerate here, you see the voltage going up, inc increasing the pressure. 
as the car gets up to speed and you're just cruising the voltage starts to drop down um, secondary the same thing this also is to do with the ratio change when with the change of pressures your ROM the read only memory a lot of people say that you should keep the ROM with the original vehicle so if you have a, a vehicle come in you elect to put a used transmission in it or buy a reman unit um, a lot of people say take the ROM out of your original transmission and put it into the the unit you're putting into that that will save you a little bit of time of reinitializing the ROM but I do have to add if you pull the pan off some of these reman company transmissions or dealer units they may void your warranty um, also you need to show programming it is done on a lot of the reman units I know Chrysler um, and Nissan will both void the warranty if you can't show proof of not reprogramming this transmission I've also heard of some of the um, auto records like LKQ. I've heard that they require programming on these also or they'll avoid your warranty. So here's your ROM pins. Five um, pins one through five. The connector actually has six uh, spots but there's only five pins. Here's your trans pins connector here and then TCMs for um, TCM connector on the design one. So ROM pin number one, trans pin connector number 20, and TCM connector 46 should all have five volts on them. N no testing we can do on, on the select one, two, and three solenoids unless we we're doing an ohms or checking the, the wire itself from the TCM to the ROM to make sure there's no breaks um, or shorted to ground or something like that and pin 5 is your ground so here's design 2 I'm not going to go over everything again it's basically everything exactly the same the only thing changes is this column right here TCM pin number since this is design 2 the TCM pins change everything else is the same Here's the ROM location. It is right here underneath the valve body right on top of the uh, range uh, sensor. And this is here is your range sensor. This end here is connecting into the manual valve itself. Also has a temp sensor built into the range sensor. Range switch connectors. There's uh, seven pin, seven wires on the range switch. To check this range switch to me uh, it's probably the easiest to do this at either the trans case connector um, is the easiest way to back probe there if we were te testing switch one we want to back probe um, pin number four so let's see number four we back probe this wire here and then we want to move your shifter from park it's going to be off uh, go to re voltage in reverse so you're going to see a voltage change from park to reverse and then you'll see another voltage change when you go from drive to low do that on each switch so move so move your back probe over to pin five to test switch number two and you're going to see a voltage change from reverse to neutral on this one and then neutral drive and low are all going to be seen so to test the range switch, test each wire individually and compare it to this chart to make sure it's functioning correctly. Um, switch number three monitor and switch number three uh, are basically um, different wires but they, measure, they operate exactly the same. So the temperature sensor, um, one thing when you're dealing with cores or you're changing um, valve body, that kind of thing, your temperature sensor is different 
between design one and design two. They don't have a certain cutoff date, but you're going to want to make sure you get the correct te uh, temp sensor or range switch. So the design one that has the two the two TCM connectors. Um, here's your pin numbers in the uh, trans case connectors, pin 17 and 19. The difference here is your ohms. Um, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you have 2.5 thousand ohms. In the design 2, the late temperature sensor at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you have 6.5 thousand ohms. Back over to temperature sensor 1, the early temp sensor, you have 300 ohms at 176 degrees. And then on the late design, 176 degrees is 900 ohms. So if you use the wrong temp sensor, you're going to definitely get an issue uh, with temperature sensor readings, overheating problems, those kind of conditions. So keep in mind, there are uh, two different temperature sensor readings. The range switch itself act, act the same on both. Here's our temperature sensor graphed out. So as you see, as the voltage is high, and as transmission temperature increases, our voltage is going down. And on the bottom here, we have Fahrenheit. So here we started out about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and we ended up about 185 degrees. As you see, degrees goes up. The, the graph for the voltage is just the opposite. Let me back up here one bit. One thing I'd like to say about the temperature sensor um, a lot of the scan tools have temperature sensor reading problems. They don't read correctly on the scan tool. So if you get an overheat temperature, let's say uh, 260 degrees or something along those lines, make sure you use a, a temperature probe and see actually what the trans temps itself is. Um, have found a lot of issues with the PIDs on the Snap-on scan tools for temperatures not reading correctly. Some of the testing that we, we do, they're going to ask for um, temp count or tell you to warm up the transmission to a certain temperature count before you start doing some of the testing. So what we have here is your, your ATF temp count as seen, as seen on the scan tool. So let's say your ATF temp count 64 uh, is going to be equal to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, a lot of the diag will say the temperature needs to be between let's say like a hundred and twenty four temp count and um, uh, sixty nine so as you look on this graph hundred and twenty four is hundred and forty degrees and then one hundred and sixty nine temp count equals one hundred and eighty five degrees so basically use this chart. Um, if you don't know, uh, if your scan tool doesn't have the temp counts on it, uh, you can still go and find out what temperature it needs to be between those counts. And, and if your scan tool is reading the temperature, you can cross this over to make sure you're within that uh, certain parameter. So primary speed sensor and our input speed sensor is right here on top of the valve body itself. The primary speed sensor is reading off the primary pulley and it's set, sending the signal to the TCM. This is a Hall effects uh, type sensor. The faster the RPM, the closer the, squ the square wave comes together. So we have five volts going into our temp sensor, or our, excuse me, our speed sensor. We have a ground wire and then we have the signal going to the TCM. So the temp sensor is on pin, or the, excuse me, the 5 volt sensor is on pin 20. Ground is number 19, and the signal is coming out 22. If you want to check this at the uh, TCM, here's design 1 uh, information. You'll want to check the signal on 38. Design 2, you're going to want to check the signal on 33. At about 12 miles per hour, you're going to have 680 hertz is a normal reading uh, for the sensor.
Vehicle speed sensor or secondary speed sensor is located on the outside of the transmission here on the top. Need to pay close attention. Some of these sensors have a spacer underneath the sensor right here. So if you're changing the sensor or your R&R &R guy pulls out the sensor, make sure he takes note uh, if there's a, a spacer or not underneath it. Testing this is, is basically the same. You have a ground, uh, a ground and you have battery voltage um, for the sensor. The other sensor is 5 volt, but this one is operated off battery. That's about the only difference. And at 12 miles per hour, you should have about 350 hertz. All right, so now we're going to get over some solenoid testing and information on uh, the solenoids. First, we're going to do the pressure control solenoid. It's right here on the corner of the valve body. Pressure control solenoid is grounded. There's a couple ground wires right here, uh, right here on the valve body. And I believe there's one more right here. So I think there's three locations on the valve body where sensors are grounded. So we need to make sure those bolts are tight so those wires are in good condition and don't break when tighten the bolt. So pressure, pressure control solenoid A, we'd want to check pins 2. So pin 2 right here on the case connector. And then ground to the valve body somewhere with your other end of your meter. You should have 3.9 ohms. Push control solenoid A, um, when the solenoid is off, the solenoid regulator oil is going over to the pressure, pressure regulator valve and that is giving you maximum pressure. When duty cycle increases, um, it's closing off the oil to the pressure regulator valve. A couple different designs of solenoids here on the bottom right. This is the first style of solenoid. It has this black nipple on the end. And here's a top view of the second design. This valve body that I'm working on is a 2010 Nissan Murano. So it's the second design. Now we're talking about the pressure control solenoid B, which controls the secondary pulley pressures. Same type of solenoid, pressure uh, with no electrical or no command. Oil is going to your pressure regulator valve. As the solenoid ramps up, it's closing the, the valve inside the solenoid and it lowers or closes the oil off the tip here of the solenoid. Again, a couple different styles of solenoids, same as the other one that we talked about. Here's the location of your pressure control solenoid B on the left, it's the second one over. To test the ohm through the case connector, you'd use pin 3 and you should have 3.9 ohms. Now we are checking the lockup solenoid. Lockup solenoid, the torque converter clutch solenoid. The solenoid controls oil to the lockup clutch. It's kind of a dip different operating solenoid itself. So we have solenoid regulator oil coming in between the two O-rings on both these solenoids. When the solenoid is off, the oil the solenoid regulator oil going into the solenoid is blocked off. That's why I don't have an arrow going here. There's no oil going um, through the solenoid, through the solenoid regulator oil. It's open to exhaust. So oil coming from the valve body goes through the solenoid and out the, the top of the solenoid here is just exhausting off all the oil. When the solenoid is operator or duty cycle is turned on, the solenoid regulator valve inside the solenoid um, this port is opened up and then the oil is going out to the out to the switch valve around the switch valve and to, uh, to control lockup oil and the exhaust side is blocked to check the ohms you're going to be on pins 12 at the case connector uh, let's see where's pin 12 here it is right here so pin 12 on the case connector and you should have three three to nine ohms uh, to test the solenoid and the lockup solenoid is the third one over from the left in this picture. Alright, now we're dealing with the lockup solenoid. 
select solenoid. So this has two different purposes. It controls lockup and the select solenoid. Um, lockup solenoid uh, controls forward and reverse engagement feel and torque converter engagements. Uh, it does this by moving the switch valve position. This is a normally closed solenoid. It's an on-off style solenoid. So we have solenoid regulator oil going into the tip of the solenoid. And when the solenoid is off, there's no flow going out of the solenoid. So it's basically closed off. When the solenoid is turned on, solenoid regulator oil goes through the tip and comes outside here and goes to the switch valve and moves the switch valve. Lockup select solenoid is the one all the way to the right in this picture. And to check it electrically, it'd be at pin 13. And you should have 6 to 19 ohms. The stepper motor or ratio control motor. Um, this is not a hydraulic solenoid. It's more of a mechanical solenoid. This plunger here that's connected to the ratio control arm and moves the ratio control valve. And it uh, controls the ratio change one part of the ratio change I should say. So as the TCM turns on and off there's four coils inside the solenoid. It turns on and off these four coils in a certain pattern. As the the coils turn on and off this rod is going to either uh, extend or extract in uh, mechanical mechanically. So there is no hydraulic oil or anything going through this. It's all a mechanical solenoid that changes the length of this rod. The stepper motor is located on the bottom of the valve body here. And the, the solenoid or the motor, stepper motor is grounded, has two different grounds going to the valve body itself. So it is grounded to the valve body. To check the solenoid, you'd want to check pin six and then ground to the case or to the valve body and you should get 15 ohms the same as pin 7, 8, and 9 so each individual coil is all going to have 15 ohms um, you will see a lot of stepper motor codes usually these are performance codes and usually for the most part I have not seen too many bad stepper motors a lot of people replace them because of the stepper motor codes and stepper motor itself is not necessarily at fault. There is some stepper motor controllers where you can plug the stepper motors into this controller and are able to uh, test the stepper motor by turning a knob and adjusting it up and down. There's some great YouTube videos out there of some people that made stepper motor controllers too. Or you can get one. I believe uh, both Transtar, whatever it takes, are now sell selling these stepper motor controllers. Little expensive, but if you do a lot of CVTs or you want to prove the stepper motor is good or bad, um, recommend getting one of these controllers. Um, it will definitely help you test these solenoids. Clutch apply chart. As I said before uh, in one of the earlier chapters, very easy. Reverse, you have your reverse brake on. Forward, you have your forward clutch on. Uh, solenoid control is a little bit different on this unit because we don't have shifts or we don't have shift solenoids. But for the most part, every solenoid is used pretty much in every position. So secondary oil pressure sensor uh, measures, measures the um, sensor pressure itself. Also have a... a primary oil pressure sensor uh, in this transmission too but in, in all positions line pressure is being changed line pressure solenoids being controlled lockup or excuse me not lockup but the secondary um, solenoid is also be, being controlled in every position lockup is the lockup solenoid itself is only to be used in drive usually it comes on around 14 miles an hour or so the lockup select is going to be used um, for your engagement so it's, it's going to change positions in, in park reverse and neutral it's all going to be affected and your stepper motor controls 
your ratio change it's going to do that in reverse it also moves positions in neutral and in drive power flow so this uh, unit is pretty simple when it comes to power flow I'm going to start here on the left this is your forward drum this is your input shaft that's going into the converter and splined into your forward drum one thing I like to note is you see this ring gear here is part of the outside of the forward drum so the ring gear is connected mechanically to the uh, input shaft the other thing is the sun gear the inner splines here are connected right straight to the primary and the sun gear also has the forward clutch spline so that this hub goes into your forward clutch right here these forward clutch splines are connected directly to the uh, sun gear which is connected directly to the output primary um, pulley here your reverse clutches are splined uh, are in the case these clutches are splined to the outside of this planet the planet uh, when, in, uh, when in reverse is held stationary um, in reverse and basically your your ring gear is rotating the small gears the small gears are rotating the sun gear in the opposite direction the sun gear is connected to your your pulley we'll go over this again a little bit later so here's our power flow in park um, in park we have our park pole it's locked to the uh, on the um, secondary pulley is where the park gear is and it is mechanically held in park we have here's the reverse clutches those are off and your forward clutches are off input shaft is turning nothing's connected here because both clutches are off vehicles not able to move or anything like that so in reverse over here on the right hand side is our input input shaft is turning input shaft turns the ring gear which is right here on both sides which is part of the forward drum itself so this ring gear is turning right here is the pinion gear so it's turning this smaller pinion gear your reverse clutch is hot is on so this whole reverse this whole planet housing is not moving so that forces the ring gear turning the small gear. The small gear cannot rotate uh, inside the transmission, but it is rotating, making your sun gear move the off opposite direction. Sun gear spline to your pulley, pulley to the belt, out to the transfer gear and differential, and we're in the reverse position. Neutral, park pole is not disconnected. The vehicle is able to roll. We still have no forward and reverse uh, clutches are not on so it's into uh, a floating mode the input shaft is turning and the gear set is floating it may be rotating because of the drag but nothing is applied so there's no power flow in, in neutral in drive very simple your input clutch or your input shaft is turning from the converter power is transmitted to the sun gear when the forward clutch is on right here the forward clutch is on forward clutch is spined to the sun gear directly so we have what basically one solid mass turning the input clutch forward hub is turning the sun gear sun gear is connected to the pulley the pulley is turning the belt the belt is sending power out the other pulley to the transfer gear and out to the wheels air check locations um, I'm not a huge fan of air checks when it comes to CVTs but the, the, the thing I will say is your reverse clutch here in the case needs to air check real tight and your where is it I'm looking for the forward clutch oil here it is right here sorry about that so your forward clutch oil so these two taps you should be able to air check 35 40 psi and they should air check dead tight one thing i would like to say 
when you are testing your secondary pressure right here, you can air test the secondary pulley. And your primary pulley is right here. Watch out when you air test these because they will spit oil out one or the other if, if that pulley moves. There's a fair amount of oil in these pulleys so they will make a mess when you do this. Um, if you air check the primary and secondary, the, the pulley will apply. It will squeeze together. It necessarily is not going to not going to move the belt unless the, the assembly is rotating. Um, so you can air check secondary and the primary pulley. They should air check fairly tight. The belt is not going to move uh, unless it, unless it's rotated. Up here on the top, you see a lot of these forward pressure taps, line pressure taps, um, and primary pressure taps. These are the passages that go to the taps on the outside of the case for where you hook your gauge up. So those are just dead tight holes. Already kind of discussed this, but I brought this back up again. Here's our uh, solenoid firing chart or solenoid chart. Um, basically lockup is going to come in around 14 miles an hour your lockup and your select solenoids are used for your engagements also so they're they're going to be used in park reverse and neutral stepper motor is used for ratio change um, so it's going to change ratios in reverse and drive line pressure sensor and secondary or line pressure solenoid and a secondary pressure solenoid uh, is used at all times to keep this belt from slipping and it helps change ratio also and here's just a, a quick breakout of all the solenoids, ohm resistance, and your case connector. Um, design 1 and Design 2 are the same um, at the case connector. We pretty much went over this already in solenoid operation. Uh, I was going to kind of do this separate, but I did it all on the first slide. So this is a PWM solenoid. When the solenoid's off, uh, oil is going right directly to your pressure regulator valve. When the solenoid is cycled on, it basically closes off oil going to the pressure regulator and exhausts out the solenoid itself. Again, there's two types of solenoids. Um, I would not interchange the solenoids, but uh, this is the, the first design. Second design is, it looks like this here on the, on the left. Pressure control solenoid B uh, controls secondary uh, oil pressure. Solenoid uh, regulating oil is going in between the pulley or in, in between the O-rings here. When it is off, oil is going straight to the pressure regulator valve. When it's on, uh, the oil is closed off going to the pressure regulator valve and oil is exhausted out the solenoid here. Same as the other solenoid, there's two different types of solenoid. One has a nipple on the back, the other one's flat. Lockup um, solenoid, torque converter clutch control solenoid. So when it's off, oil is able to exit through or go into the small end of the solenoid and exit out the exhaust. The solenoid regulator oil is blocked off and not allowed in, this, in the solenoid at that, at that time. When duty cycle is turned on, it closes the exhaust off and sends oil out to the TCC out the end of the solenoid itself. This is the on-off solenoid for lockup and lockup select. Solenoid regulator oil comes through the, the snout or the tip of the solenoid. When the solenoid's off, there's no flow. When the solenoid on, it sends oil to the switch valve to, to move the switch valve position. Stepper motor, um, we discussed this a little bit earlier already, has four coils on and off. Uh, the computer turns the four coils on and off in a certain pattern to get this plunger to move in and out to change the ratios. Each coil should me measure 15 ohms. Uh, exploded view of the valve body. Here's the lower section of the valve body. There's a small valve body plate here. There's no filters, no small parts in the section of the valve body. Here's your TCC limit valve. You want to check this bore, make sure it is in good shape. The numbers here are the spring size numbers. So we have the length of the spring, 
Then we have the uh, width of the spring and the size of the spring wire. Primary regulator valve, you want to definitely check this um, valve for wear along with the secondary regulator valve. These two I have seen wear. Um, the coating comes off, the valve bore itself will wear. There's some aftermarket um, ramers uh, to change uh, these two valves also. Here's in the middle valve body. Um, on the main valve body check on this section is your solenoid regulator valve. Make sure you pull this out and check the solenoid regulator valve bore. Uh, it likes to wear out uh, very quickly. The other one is the secondary primary control. Make sure you check this valve. It, it's another highly worn uh, valve. We have two screens. This little flat screen here goes in the groove. And then we have this little uh, square screen. It has a little peg here with a, a, it's a, it's a spring basically so it keeps it tight down. Uh, the the uh, spring side goes up towards to the plate itself. Um, this lockup control plunger, I almost forgot. This lockup control plunger, make sure you take this little tiny valve out of this, this boost valve assembly. Make sure this valve is free. Make sure that this uh, plunger is not worn. I uh, have seen some lockup issues because that plunger is completely stuck. So you want to take every valve out of this valve body and make sure they're all free. Um, I don't do that to every transmission, but this is one one valve body that I completely disassemble, pull every val valve out and clean. These uh, CVTs like to put out like a black resin or a black material that loves to get in these valves and, and to hang them up. So this is the um, top side of the valve body that ha houses all the solenoids. I forgot one thing on the last slide. Let me go back here. Sorry about that. There are four check balls in this valve body. Uh, here's the location of the two here and the two here. These are used for uh, clutch apply in forward and reverse. Sorry about that. Now back to the top section of the valve body. We have a lube valve, a little blow off valve here. Spring down first, little plaster insert on the top. Ratio control valve, this spring here in the ratio control valve is very tiny uh, or very thin. Very easy to miss or misplace when you pull the valve body off. It'll pop this valve out and a lot of times that ratio spring will get missing. Here's the sizes of that spring, but just pay attention. That spring is easy to misplace. Um, have not seen any ratio control valves with not without a spring so if you get one that does not have the spring somebody else has misplaced it before you or you have lost it has the filter in uh, this uh, separator plate here the opening goes to the separator plate secondary pressure switch or sensor a is here on the valve by itself of course we have all of our solenoids and the wiring goes on the top of the valve body here. Let's talk about the steel belt. This steel belt has all these elements like this. I'm going to guess roughly around 400 elements or so per belt. They are stacked uh, up and held together by um, steel rings. So these steel rings go in the slots here and keep this belt uh, all together. Each one of these steel rings usually has six uh, or more uh, steel rings that are all individually different size. So you have six rings or more per uh, side here. So you're going to have like have 12 steel rings. They are all different sizes. If this belt comes apart, just buy a new belt for the most part. You can get them back together, but each one of these steel rings are a different size. All these elements have to go in a certain direction um, you you can put it back together but it, it is very difficult best way of keeping these things from falling apart is put a couple zip ties around the belt itself when you're disassembling it here in the picture you can see these are all the steel belts you see there's way more than six in this one um, I've seen 12 in some of them so this this belt probably has 12 in it 
to check the belt you want to see these ridges on the sides of the belt this is a normal uh, good looking belt I would reuse this belt when you start seeing metal piling up or these wear mark or these uh, grooves uh, go go thin or missing or um, you know is, is smooth your belt's worn you definitely need to replace it so this is a push belt what it means basically is uh, the primary pulley is squeezing on the on both sides of the belt here and as it rotates it pushes the belt across to the next pulley so this all these steel uh, elements are stacked together and you're basically pushing one steel rod from one belt to the other uh, there is some slack on the back side of the belt um, which is normal and that that's why these these belts have the bands is to keep all these things lined up together here's our um, our pulleys the pulleys themselves primary pulley uh, primary oil pressure is controlled by the TCM using the primary pressure solenoid the ratio control valve and the stepper motor all regulate the pressure uh, going into the primary pulley it squeezes on the belt and it also changes pressure uh, for ratio change so how this basically worked this this left side of this uh, picture here is low low gear position as you see the belts far in when it goes to the higher ratios the belt is squeezed in or the pulley squeezed together and the belt will, will right will push itself out on secondary oil pressure uh, is controlled by the TCM using secondary uh, solenoid control valve and the secondary solenoid itself so you have secondary oil coming down through here and it is squeezing the belt or the pulley together onto the belt the left side of this pulley is the high gear position you see it's separated and on the right side is low, low gear position so each one of these pictures are so showing the pulleys move to each position so to keep it si simple and kind of sum it up both ha both pulleys have enough pressure to keep the belt from slipping at all times the pulley that has the most pressure will squeeze together and shut in and force the belt outwards so when this squeezes when this pulley squeezes together it, it's going to force this belt outwards and then on the other pulley here it's going to force this belt out on it also too so as the pull the ratio change happens the one with the most pressure is going to squeeze tighter forcing the belt into the position it needs to be for the ratio change here's basically just a generic um hydraulic block diagram there is no hydraulics for this valve body so you have your oil pump here it controls your pressure regulator valve sends oil to your clutch regulator valves torque converter regulator valves and kind of branches out from there your pressure regulator valve is controlled by your your line pressure solenoid valve your secondary pressure solenoid valve controls the uh, secondary valve which controls the secondary pulley your pressure regulator valve here is controlling your the control valve the primary control valve and the primary pulley pressure your select switch valve whichever position it is in is either going to send oil to the torque converter itself or it's going to go up here get oil from the uh, Man, uh, control excuse me the select switch valve would whichever position it's going to be in it's going to either send oil to the, your torque converter or it's going to send oil to the select control valve which sends oil to your manual valve which determines if it's going to apply the forward or the reverse clutch um, for the most part um, here's your two uh, lockup solenoids so you have your lockup select solenoid here 
It is controlling which position the switch valve is in, determining if it's going to go to the forward and reverse clutch or to the torque converter clutch. The torque converter clutch solenoid sends oil through the switch valve basically. It doesn't move this valve, but it sends oil through the valve and goes over to the torque converter. So this is basically showing how everything kind of intertwines together which solenoid is controlling which valve, which valve is controlling which, which pulley or clutch, that kind of thing. This will conclude our chapter on theory and operation for chapter 4 of the JATCO CVT uh, transmission. We want to thank you for participation in the Mutual Training Solution powered by HERA. Until next time, let's keep fixing transmissions together.